Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, Episode 8, Marshal Jordan, who had the unfortunate nickname of The Anvil because he was hammered so many times in battle. His battle record was actually a respectable nine wins and eight losses. But as the old saying goes, quote, success has many fathers while failure is an orphan, end quote. In the large battles of Stockach, Talavera, and Vittoria, he received a large part of the blame for those losses. We shall see if these criticisms were justified. Most of Jordan's success came before Napoleon was emperor. Napoleon reinstituted the Marshallate in 1804 to unite all fragments of French society, and thus Jordan, the staunch Republican, was made a marshal. In retrospect, it probably would have been better for both parties if he hadn't become one. Jean-Baptiste Jordan was born on April 29, 1762, in the town of Limoges in west central France. He was the son of a doctor, Roche Jordan. Sadly, his mother died when he was two during childbirth. His father passed away seven years later, leaving Jordan an impoverished orphan. He lived with one of his uncles until 1778, when he enlisted in the French Royal Army at the age of 16. His first posting was a world-famous one, serving overseas in the American Revolutionary War. He served as a private throughout, and at first his unit had success in the capture of Grenada Island from the British in 1779. Grenada was one of Britain's most lucrative colonies, producing vast quantities of sugar. The island was eventually returned to the British following the end of the Revolutionary War. Jordan later participated in the ill-fated siege on the city of Savannah, Georgia. His attacking force suffered 800 casualties before retreating to the West Indies in the Caribbean. After returning to France, he was discharged from service in 1784 with various health ailments probably contracted during his service in the Caribbean. In 1788, he married a dressmaker named Jean Nicola. He went into the drapery business with his new wife, who watched the shop while he traveled the roads of France with a peddler's pack on his shoulders. Very few who met him would have suspected that 10 years later, he'd be the most famous general in France. He and his wife would go on to have five daughters, Jean outlived the marshal by seven years, dying at the age of 80. Getting back to Jordan, in 1789 he closed up shop and joined the army as a volunteer. His worldly experience and leadership soon led to promotion, first to captain. In 1791, he was chosen to become lieutenant colonel of his battalion. Jordan led them ably and methodically in the victory of Jemap in 1792, and again in near Winden in 1793. By May of 1793, he'd reached the rank of Brigadier General. Two months later, the esteemed plateau of General of Division. In September, he led his troops to a tactical win at the Battle of Hanshut. He received a grape shot wound to the chest during this battle. Following these successes, he received command of an army, more from default than anything else. The three previous commanders, Generals Custine, Luckner, and Hochart, had gone to the guillotine. It was a difficult time to be a general during the French Revolution. At every army headquarters were four political officials to ensure the loyalty and fidelity of every soldier to the new French Republic. Any suspected royalist feelings or setbacks in battle could lead to a possible death sentence for an army commander. His first task as commander was the relief of a fortress in northern France that was under siege 
by a combined Dutch-Austrian force. At the Battle of Watini in 1793, Jordan was accompanied by politician and mathematician Lazar Carnot, also known as, quote, the organizer of victory, end quote. Carnot was a polarizing figure who some give credit to helping Napoleon revolutionize warfare through his army reforms. After an initial setback due to strategy squabbling between Jordan and Carnot, the French army prevailed. As one historian put it, quote, Carnot's talents as organizer of victory are beyond dispute, but his tactical skills were minimal. To drive away a poorly led covering force of 20,000 with the 45,000 available to the Army of the North should have been no big problem. But the business was sadly bungled. Carnot insisted that there should be a double envelopment movement, a favorite maneuver of his combined with a frontal attack, thus carefully dispersing the French numerical superiority, end quote. Carnot insisted Jordan followed up on this victory with another attack on the retreating Austrians. Jordan refused, saying, quote, The infantry have no shoes, the cavalry have no forage, and the artillery no horses. End quote. An irate Carnot returned to Paris with his version of events, and Jordan was later put on trial in January of 1794 during the height of the Reign of Terror. At his trial, he was saved by the testimony of an eyewitness to the battle, one of the other army political appointees who rose and defended the general's actions. Jordan escaped the death penalty, but was dismissed from the army and put on house arrest. By the end of January, he was back at his drapery business. A month later, he was back in favor with the government and appointed to the Army of the Moselle along the border of Belgium. In June of 1794, Jordan led 70,000 troops in the famous Battle of Flores against the Dutch Austrian army. It was a vicious 15 hour battle, resulting in 5,000 casualties on each side, a very high number at that time. Luckily, Jordan had a large number of talented officers in his army, including Bernadotte, Clébert, Lefebvre, and a certain Colonel Soult, who slugged it out with the Austrians around Flores. 21 years later, Marshal Soult and Napoleon would wage a similar battle with the Prussians around Ligny. The victory at Flores made Jordan a national hero and cemented his future status as Marshal. Jordan's army marched through Brussels and entered Germany at Cologne and Dusseldorf. There in Germany, he joined with the army of General Moreau in a campaign against the Austrians under Archduke Charles. As usual, the government in France could not supply their armies abroad, and so they lived off the land. The future Marshal Soult criticized this practice, saying the army could, quote, exist only by plunder. And this both raised the country against us and destroyed the discipline of the troops, end quote. But this was fine with General Jordan. He believed firmly in the principles of the revolution, along with the ideal of the French army spreading the gospel of republicanism to oppressed peoples of Europe who lived under autocratic monarchies. Unfortunately for Jordan, Archduke Charles was one of the best generals in the Austrian army and dealt him a loss at the Battle of Würzburg, where Jordan suffered 3,000 casualties. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, 
you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Around this time, Jordan's ailments from his service in the Caribbean flared up again, and he resigned his command in September. He remained on the Army's unemployment list until 1799. In this downtime, he tried his hand as a politician, as representative in the Council of 500. He became the framer of a famous conscription law of 1798, also known as the Jordan Law. His famous declaration was, quote, any Frenchman is a soldier and owes himself to the defense of the nation, end quote. The law stipulated that all single and childless men between the ages of 20 and 25 were available for draft into military service. Exemptions existed for the clergy, industrial workers, students, and public office holders. The law discriminated against the poor and peasant population because of the legal practice of replacement, which allowed anyone who had money to purchase someone to enlist in their stead. In 1799, France was threatened by foreign danger again. Jordan was appointed to command in the army of the Danube to match wits against Archduke Charles again. He had 34,000 men and 62 cannons arrayed against 72,000 troops and 114 cannons of Charles. The resulting battle of Stockach resulted in a loss for Jordan. Despite being outmanned, Jordan attacked, which caught the Archduke off guard. The French concentrated their forces into shorter lines, which created intense fighting as Charles's line was more extended. But he pulled additional troops from his reserves to strengthen his front. Jordan was nearly trampled to death while trying to rally his retreating troops. Although Jordan suffered fewer casualties, 4,000 to the Archduke's 5,800, it represented 12% of his fighting force, and he had to withdraw. Afterwards, he was reassigned as Inspector General of the Infantry. In November 1799, Napoleon made his bid for taking over the government as First Council in the coup d'etat. Jordan, the true Republican, opposed this power grab, as it didn't align with the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. In 1800, he was assigned as governor of the Piedmont region in Italy. While there, he restored order to the countryside, fixed the territory's finances, and established justice in the court system. His conduct was so exemplary that the king of Sardinia sent him a portrait enriched with diamonds. Despite the opposition to Napoleon's consulate, he was selected as one of the original 18 marshals in May of 1804. He was not actively involved again until 1806, when Napoleon's brother Joseph became king of Naples, and Jordan was chosen as his chief of staff. A genuine friendship developed between the two men, and when Joseph exchanged the crown of Naples for the crown of Spain in 1808, he brought Jordan. Joseph's arrival in the capital of Madrid lasted about a week before he and Jordan had to retreat behind the Ebro River following General du- Dupont's defeat at the Battle of Balen. Napoleon then brought in heavy reinforcements and recaptured Madrid in December 1808 and reinstalled his brother as king. As chief of staff, Jordan did his honorable best to carry out the the king's orders. He issued directives and strategies to other marshals and generals in Spain. But all of these subordinates knew that only one man's orders had to be followed, that of the emperors. The other marshals in Spain, namely Bessier, Victor, Soult, Ney, and Suchet, only pretended to conform to Jordan's orders from King Joseph. 
None of these headstrong marshals had a favorable opinion of Jordan's military talents. The first big setback for the King Joseph Marshal Jordan Brain Trust occurred in July 1809. The future Duke of Wellington advanced with 21,000 British troops and 36,000 Spanish troops toward Madrid. Jordan set up a blocking force of 46,000 troops, while Marshal Soult was marching to aid them with 50,000 more imperial troops. Unfortunately, Marshal Victor, who had tactical command of Jordan's force, launched an ill-advised night attack before Soult arrived. It was brutally repulsed. Victor then renewed his attack in the morning with the same result. King Joseph, looking to enhance his military reputation, allowed Victor to continue his assaults despite Jordan's remonstrations against the idea. Still, it was a close-run battle, as even Wellington admitted to, with both sides inflicting 7,000 casualties. This was 25% of the British force compared to only 18% of the French. However, Napoleon was furious with this defeat and chastised the leadership of Joseph and Jordan. Afterwards, a demoralized Jordan applied for sick leave and returned to France to recover mentally and physically. In 1811, he was reinstated as Joseph's chief of staff as Napoleon pulled troops from Spain for his upcoming invasion of Russia. Joseph and Jordan were giving direct command of only 15,000 troops and basically controlled only the parts of Spain that fell under the shadow of French bayonets. After Marshal Marmont's disastrous 1812 defeat at Salamanca at the hands of Wellington, Joseph and Jordan again pulled out of Madrid towards France. There, near the border, they linked up with the armies of Suchet and Soult. Finally, the marshals worked together and pushed the overextended and undersupplied Wellington back towards Portugal. Joseph reclaimed his capital city of Madrid in December, where he received word of Napoleon's disaster in Russia. Napoleon continued to draw troops from Spain to rebuild his armies to hold off the Allies. By the summer of 1813, the British army and their Spanish-Portuguese allies had made numerous inroads into Spain. King Joseph and his court again fled the capital with all of the captured booty from five years of looting Spain. Gold, artwork, clothing, cooks, women... One French officer remarked that King Joseph's baggage train, quote, looked like a traveling brothel, end quote. To save face, Joseph wanted to have an honorable battle before giving up his kingdom. But rifts were occurring within the command structure of the French. Joseph complained that his corps commanders were arguing too much and snatching supplies from each other. At the Battle of Vittoria, Joseph's 60,000 troops turned to bay and were obliterated by Wellington's 80,000 soldiers. Jordan advised against this strategy, preferring an offensive thrust towards Portugal to cut off Wellington's communications. Clearly, his advice was ignored. The defeated French army bolted in such haste that the British redcoats stopped the attack to loot the baggage trains of King Joseph. Most embarrassingly, the Marshal's baton of Jordan was captured by the British. It remains to this day in England at Windsor Castle. During the chaotic French retreat, King Joseph and Marshal Jordan were separated and almost captured. They finally met up at 11 p.m. after the battle when King Joseph was having dinner with his defeated generals. Jordan stormed into the room, looked around, and said, quote, Well, gentlemen, you wanted to have a battle, and we appear to have lost it. End quote. Following this disaster, Napoleon's Spanish Empire was irretrievably lost forever. Jordan was permanently added to the retired list by Napoleon, 
and his annual cash endowment was significantly reduced. After Napoleon's abdication, Jordan willingly served the returning King Louis XVIII. During the Hundred Days' Reign, Jordan was made a peer of France by Napoleon and was charged with command of the 15th Military District. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, he returned to the service of King Louis. As usual, Jordan received an unpleasant task to handle. He was made to serve as president of the Council of War that tried Marshal Ney. After listening to arguments and not wanting to take action against Ney, the members of the council agreed by a vote of five to two that they could not try Ney. Therefore, the Council of War declared itself incompetent to judge him. Sadly, Ney's case was then referred to the Chamber of Peers for another trial that resulted in a firing squad for the bravest of the brave. The king made Jordan a count, and later, in 1830, he was appointed governor of Les Invalides, a retirement home and hospital for army veterans. He held this post until his death in 1833. Of Jordan's mixed track record and legacy, I think Napoleon summed it up best, quote, I certainly use that man very ill. I have learned with great pleasure that since my fall, he has invariably acted well. He has thus afforded an example of that praiseworthy elevation of mind, which distinguishes men from one another. Jordan is a true patriot. And that is the answer to many things that have been said of him, end quote. I believe that is a good way to end this episode. Join me next time when we learn about Marshal Monsi, the honest marshal and vastly underrated in my opinion. Thanks for listening.